On this episode of Athletic Training Chat, we have a unique look at the athletic training profession uh, and some really, really good insight. I think a lot of this is very timely uh, within the profession. We talk about that within the episode. This is with Brian Stam, who is the husband of Julie Stam, uh, PhD, who we had on with the Brain on Youth Sports. Uh, so please check that one out as well. Uh, Brian is an MBA and then also is finishing up a master's in public health. Uh, but has done some work on the insurance side and has some unique insight into what it takes to get third-party reimbursement for athlete trainers. Um, and that opened up a ton of my eye um, to see that and really how much work it is. But then also from just the business aspect of it, he provides some really good and unique ideas that uh, can be implemented by athletic trainers in this current time of low supply but high demand for the profession that is only going to continue to grow as the profession does. So really great episode from just a different perspective. As always, we are powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. Please check them out for all your sports medicine needs. Uh, help support us with them um, in this Throw a Lifeline program. We're trying to get the second one out. We're slowly getting there, but any little bit can help us get there faster. Any amount is helpful, so please check that out at athletictrainchat.com backslash throw a lifeline. But without further ado, please enjoy this episode. episode of athletic training chat we are on with brian stam who is married to our one of our previous guests uh, dr julie stam who did uh the brain on youth sports again if you haven't checked that book out please do worth the read but um brian brings a unique aspect to a conversation as he is not an athletic trainer married to one but not one um but has some unique insight, especially as it pertains to some of the insurance uh, related things to the profession. And then also kind of current trends in the job market and everything that's going on. And so this uh, conversation seemed very, very timely, even though we've been trying to do this for almost a year now, uh, which I will bear the brunt of that not happening. But before we get started, I just wanted to turn it over uh, to give a little bit more background on what you do and how you kind of connect to the profession outside of the obvious already mentioned. Um, and then we'll get into the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me here today, Joel. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so I guess uh, I'll give a little bit of background on how I fell into this, um, into this conversation, uh, because it's not one that I necessarily should be unnecessary, uh, exactly because I'm not an athletic trainer. Sure. Um, you don't want to see me around a broken uh, bone, like a tip fit fracture. I'll be the guy that passes out next to it. So, um, definitely not an AT, uh, but I'm a big supporter of ATs. I've been working in and around, uh, with ATs for a long, long time. My wife is an athletic trainer by, by training and still holds her license. Um, very good friends with a lot of athletic trainers that went through the program here at UW Wisconsin Madison, and also um, with the Boston University Athletic Training Program, where she did a, a part of her degree with, and just great people all around. Um, my background, not being athletic training, is all things healthcare. Um, I started off working in the pharmacy area, just retail pharmacy and moved over to working on the clinical side where I worked at an office um, for about four years there um, and then moved over to insurance um, and worked for a regional insurance company here in Wisconsin for about four years. And now I work for the state of Wisconsin's uh, employer trust funds as the deputy director of the office of strategic health policy. And so we're the largest employer um, sponsored plan in the state. And so we work on all sorts of health policy there, including uh, payment mechanisms for insurance. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Beyond that, I have um, a degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison in consumer science. 
an MBA from Boston University, is focusing in healthcare, and I'm about two weeks away from a master's public health and infectious disease epidemiology from Johns Hopkins. So I'm all about healthcare. <laughs> yeah, and that uh, master's is timely, if if nothing else. Yeah, I, I was not expecting a global pandemic when I started a degree, uh, looking into how to solve those. So it's been a very, very hands-on experience. We'll put it that way. That's incredible that you started that before this all kicked off. Uh, who would have yeah. known? <laughs> Some people in the world had guesses. Um, I didn't. And like I said, it's been an interesting learning experience, not one that I'd like to necessarily repeat for the sake of everyone else, but it's at the same time, I, there's no better hands-on experience than this. So, Absolutely. So we kind of connected on the original conversation. So uh, Joe Green uh, is an athletic trainer out of Madison who is leading the charge, um, not only in Wisconsin, but kind of nationally um, and looking at third party reimbursement for athletic trainers. Uh, and that's kind of where we started the connection of just kind of your unique insight in working with him. And we were just talking um, off air a little bit on how that worked um, and really still kind of figuring out how to get athletic trainers recognized by insurance companies to get reimbursed for. So if you maybe want to tell that story a little bit and then we can kind of spin into, you know, sure. the ways that this is hopefully going to continue to evolve and grow for the profession. Sure. Absolutely. So Joe and I, um, we met and we started talking about how the insurance company that I was working for at the time essentially wasn't processing any sort of claims that were coming from uh, an athletic trainer. So athletic trainer provides services. They submit a bill to an insurance company for reimbursement for those services. And unfortunately, at that point in time, none of those bills were going through. Everything was being stopped. And this is automatically happening within a claim system at the insurance company. Now, claim systems are incredibly complicated, but they essentially take a bill sent from any provider and try and determine if this is something that should be paid. And if so, at what level should that be paid? And then on the back end, hopefully the, the doctor or provider, or whoever it happens to be, gets, gets the money that they, they charged. Um, what was happening was that we eventually found out that there was something called a direct exclusion that was built into the certificate of coverage um, at an insurance company. And this is essentially the, the laws uh, that the configuration system for the claim system works off of. And it's all written by medical professionals and also business professionals that come together and determine what will be covered and what will not be covered. Okay. And um, in there, there was something called a direct exclusion. And a direct exclusion is kind of like a you shall not pass. Um, it's this Gandalf at the, the bridge saying, no, this isn't going <laughs> through. It doesn't matter who's sending it, how they're sending it, um, what service it is. That bill is not getting paid um, because of the direct exclusion. And the direct exclusion that we had here was essentially that athletic trainers as a profession were not allowed to submit bills for anything. And so we started asking around as to why that was there. And we couldn't get a straight answer from anybody. Essentially, the answer was, well, that's how it's always been done, which is, I think, the answer I hate most in this world. Sure. Um, so I started taking a look at it and uh, put together essentially a proposal to say, hey, we should take this direct exclusion off. This doesn't necessarily open up the floodgates for everyone to be able to submit everything. This just removes the barrier from happening, which allows then policies and procedures to be put in place to allow for the billing to happen. And this proposal, essentially, it required a fair amount of research. It required a lot of um, going back and forth with all sorts of medical professionals. And once again, through the business side of, of an insurance company to say, should we do this? Yes or no? What, what's best for the membership? What's best for the overall organization? Is this a trend that we're seeing in the industry? Um, there's a number of other aspects. And what ended up happening was we were able to get that exclusion removed. So now the barrier is gone, um, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem because you still don't have the pathway for athletic trainers to be able to submit bills. 
because there's no contract, there's no contract language involved in that. Sure. You only remove the barrier. Okay. Right, with, you got me so far? I'm with you. Okay. So barrier's gone. Now the next step of this is to determine what can be submitted. Um, and this is really, really tricky because it's not only the provider type that we're talking about as an athletic trainers, but it's the setting type that we're talking about. Should this, should we accept um, bills from athletic trainers from when uh, ATs are working at a school, you know, they're on the sidelines, should that be a billable event or it should only be clinic or somewhere in between? And there's a whole bunch of different settings you can have. Um, I think we track well over 50 at my job. Um, so we had to determine what was the best medicine service location for them. The next step to that is determining what individual services are billable. Um, and part of this is on the athletic trainer to determine as in what they feel, what they feel is worth submitting a bill for. And then also from the insurance side saying, hey, what is providing value to our membership um, as, a, as a healthcare component? And what you end up having in a normal healthcare, um, a normal insurance conversation here is you have a provider on one side and you've got the insurance company on the other side. And it's a negotiation. You know, one, the provider wants to say, you know, XYZ pr pr procedure should be uh, re uh, reimbursed to me at $150 per episode. I'm just making numbers up here. And, yep. and the insurance side says, hey, you know, we hear you on that, but we feel it's, it should be reimbursed at a hundred and somewhere in between they come to a number, right? And then once those services are established, then that all can be built into the claim system through configuration and bills can eventually then go from the, the provider, the athletic trainer through the insurance system and they can get reimbursed. So we had to build all of that pathway, which took, a long, long time. Um, this isn't something that happens overnight sure. uh, by any means. And it requires a lot of both medical and business acumen to go into it. Oh, where to even begin? Um, <laughs> and no, that, that is really kind of the interesting part of it. Cause I know personally, you know, just looking at different things, um, working in the kind of the traditional, if you will, setting in the collegiate setting, we've investigated multiple avenues to could we bill for services rendered in that setting, mm -hmm. um, you know, through um, our EMRs and in essence, you're making a deal with the company to do the work for, on the back end for you Yep. Uh, for that, which I know in some conversations with Joe Green, he was skeptical about those and there's some unknowns and I understand that but now even digging from just the five minute spiel you gave me I can understand a lot more of the complexity of that um, yeah it gets it gets complex and it's also and it's difficult as an athletic trainer to make that decision too because it's one of the things where you can't cry wolf on you know if you feel it's absolutely important to be reimbursed for taping an ankle Okay. Mm -hmm. Before, before a sports practice is, is that worth it when it goes down to the negotiation table versus working in a clinic, um, or working on, you know, post op rehab, Sure, you know, which th there are medical professionals that get paid handsomely for doing post op rehab and mm -hmm. there's bills for that. Why can an athletic trainer not have that? Right. Right. So when it comes to the negotiation, what are you willing to give in order to get? And that's a difficult conversation. And it's something I can't answer for an athletic trainer or for a profession as a whole. It's kind of something that they need to determine. And the tricky part here is to understand the limitations that an insurance company has, as well as the overall healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking the US, you know, $3.2 trillion disaster that we're working with right now. So one thing that every insurer is concerned about in this, uh, this situation is that it will open the floodgates for um, bills to come in. Sure. Um, I remember when I was working with Joe, 
he, we were looking at um, an example of, and I do not remember which school it was, but they essentially turned on billing for athletic trainers. And within the first year, there was a case where essentially enough were put together for a single athlete for what I'm going to consider care that it's not rehab. It's not treating an injury necessarily. I mean, it's treating an injury to an extent, but it's more maintenance care is what we mm-hmm. consider it uh, to the tune of $110,000. And that's what was billed. Now the insurance company denied all of it under maintenance care because they determined that it wasn't adding significant health care and well-being value to the member. And there's a whole road to go down there. <laughs> yeah. That, that was one I was going to say, just even from talking to some of our PTs is how even they word it. It's, from most insurances, from what I've gathered, it's about mm-hmm. returning to basic quality of life, yes. not to pristine, you know, athletic performance or whatever it may be. So even working with like younger population, you know, that that's the ultimate goal is to get them back to playing football per se. Yep. That's not necessarily what the insurance company is there for is therefore they want them to be able to get back to walking pain-free and living generally a normal life and that's exactly. kind of where they're like we're done yep and okay. this is why maintenance care is not paid for by almost every insurer and i would challenge someone to find somebody that that does pay for that sure. um i'm just waiting for my email inbox to fill up now um but <laughs> you know, this is something that we see a lot with physical therapy or with chiropractic care. Um, You can have services paid for to a certain extent. Normally there's a visit limit as in you can go to a PT 20 times or 25 times over a course of a year, but that 26th time, if it's not medically necessary, you're not getting that paid for. And that's on you as a consumer. Yep. So getting back to the original argument here, how much of the care that athletic trainers provide gets you up to that point where it becomes maintenance care? And then how do you define that, that fine line where maintenance care is now being provided that you should not be billing for? And it's really difficult. It's, it's very difficult to think about as to how uh, I defining what that is. And you have to essentially set policies that are going to ebb and flow a little bit as you figure it out, but eventually you're going to figure it out. I feel like that gets, and I know this has been kind of a question I've always had, and it gets a little hazy because even with that, like talking more of the traditional setting, you know, versus working in a clinic within a health system or whatever it may be, you know, you're going to treat, you see your patients daily, which is obviously not how it works in the healthcare system, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in the sports med kind of orthopedic, that's just not how it works. But at the same time, if you're going to be billing insurance to have that back end of writing off or however it works with co-pays and some of those other things that I feel like it gets very gray very, mm-hmm. very quickly in that insurance company is obvious, you know, if you come to work where I am now, we're probably not going to write off too many co-pays um, nope. because obviously that's a, it's a business model as well, but I feel like that could get become a very slippery slope very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. It, it can. Um, and that is, that is the major concern of insurers, which is why you saw exclusions built into most of their contracts for athletic trainers. And this isn't something new. It shouldn't be, you know, I, I don't feel like athletic trainers as a profession should feel singled out on this. Um, sure. They just happen to be um, still in there. Um, there were other professions that were, in the same boat um, a longer time ago. You know, physical therapists were in the same boat. Um, Physicians assistants were in the same boat. They just started going down this road earlier than athletic trainers did. Um, And, you know, one thing to think about here is that they went down this road in a less less complicated time. Um, You know, we look at physicians assistants, they're very well established, I feel, in Mm -hmm. the American medical system. Now, um, 10 years ago, I would say that there was definitely pushback from providers, from, you know, medical doctors, DOs, whoever it happens to be, because you could see 
them as an association, as an organization, as a, as a group saying, hey, this new group is kind of pushing in on our territory. Right. Um, and not saying an individual is going to necessarily care, but the individual times 10,000 probably will. Sure. Um, because it cuts into revenue streams. It cuts into um, you know, the poshness of, of being a medical doctor. Um, and it's, it's, uh, an industry that has a long memory, unfortunately. Right. So it's slow to move that culture. So I think athletic trainers are going down a very, very similar road that these other professions did. It's just, it's going to take a little while. I just like how you framed it. It's just giving me a whole new perspective on it. Of Not that I ever thought it was going to be quick and painless, but um, yeah. just the sheer complexity of it. Um, one question, and it, hopefully it can be a quick answer, is all the way back to those direct exclusion sure. things that you know, found. Like, Unless you had gone and looked for that, do you feel like there would have been any way for Joe – to have known that or, you know, like if, if they're just straight up, not even accepting the bill, which obviously he recognized because there was nothing coming back. Yeah. So he started to investigate, but it's not like they'd be like, you're submitting these bills and the insurance company is kicking back and saying, Oh, Hey, by the way, there's a direct exclusion. We're just not going to take any of it. Quit wasting your time. At least it doesn't seem to me that they would do that. So it depends. Okay. Um, it depends a lot on the insurance organization, how mature their claim system is. So any bill that is denied needs to have a denial reason for that associated oh, okay. with the denial. So let's say you, you were an athletic trainer, you submitted a bill, I was the insurance company, and I said no because of an exclusion. In my denial, I should, in theory, say no, this is not being paid for because we have direct exclusion X, Y, Z that permit that, that does not permit athletic trainers. Sure. They don't have to go to that level of depth. There's no requirement to say that. Um, there, they do have to say that there's um, that's being denied and give a reason, but normally those reasons are codes. Um, and sometimes those codes then reference tables that you have to then look up somewhere and you have to be able to find that. Um, sometimes there's uh, abbreviations of longer versions of a description. Sometimes you get very nice descriptions. It really depends on the insurance company. Gotcha. And so could they find it maybe through, through denied claims? Um, that would be a red flag. And then that would then lead to a further conversation where you'd have to find the actual contract language, um, which is also difficult because the um, certificate of coverage language for most insurance companies is complex and very, very thick. Hundreds it. of pages is normal. I can, can only imagine. So again, kind of back to a conversation off air, but we were talking about, you know, was this, the way to go potentially getting recognized by more insurance um, companies. And you had just referenced that that is probably a painstaking way to go and get recognized. Um, but you also kind of referenced that there would be other options as well, if you wouldn't mind sharing what those are. Sure. Um, looking at it. Yeah. So, so you can go insurance company by insurance company and, and fight that battle. Unfortunately, there's a lot of insurance companies and it takes a long time. Even if you were to generate like a formula for doing that, it's still going to take a long time. And, and I think an important thing to think about it is that if you were to, if you were to successfully, um, successfully complete this right now with an insurance company, that change probably still isn't going to go into effect for a year or two sure. because that's how uh, health health plans are designed. Um, they, they're very forward looking. So um, that's a long road. Uh, it's, it's a worthy road to go down. Uh, I appreciate people like Joe that are, that are fighting the good fight. I, I think there needs to be a lot more people um, applying a lot more pressure to do that, but it's still going to take a lot of time equally painful is going after Medicaid and Medicare um, to get athletic trainers paid for at that level. The, the really tricky part there is now we're talking about national legislation. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to get, 
you have to have a lobbyist group. You have to have a movement essentially capturing the attention of legislatures enough so that they're willing to add something into Medicare or Medicaid and essentially change those laws. Now, those change with some frequency um, to minor degrees, depending on who's in charge at the moment. Um, but it's also, those are, are, those are huge milestones. If uh-huh. athletic trainers can get that milestone accomplished, you know, Medicaid and Medicare, all of the insurers will then um, topple kind of like a, like a line of dominoes uh, sure. because they typically base their, their structure off of, you know, the, the federal government. So that's one way um, to go about it. I think it's, it's a great goal to shoot for another one that's going to take a long time to do. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so you can, you could and should continue fighting those battles at the same time. Um, we're in a really interesting moment right now in labor relations, um, in, 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 um, employment in the United States and really worldwide, but look, we're talking about the United States. So let's focus there. So I was just looking at numbers before this of the national employment report that just came out. Um, they're re- referencing that, you know, over a half million jobs were just added and 37,000 were in healthcare, um, which is great, except there's 10.4 million job openings, including um, a new 141,000 in healthcare since last month. That, so we didn't, we didn't actually go down it. They were just added more job openings in healthcare, right? Sure. And so anybody in this country right now that's on the fringe, wondering if they should continue working at their employer, if they're providing the right benefits, if they have enough salary, if whatever it happens to be, and if they're even considering jumping ship to somewhere else, should absolutely do so right now because the market is in your favor, right? There's a huge shortage of supply and the demand is overwhelming. So you've got employers that typically wouldn't go to extreme lengths to get new employees doing so. Okay. So, you know, you go to any grocery store right now, I mean, I live in Madison. I go to a grocery store here and I'm seeing, uh, you know, now hiring signs, 1750 an hour plus a $1,500 sign on Bose which if you think about that, I, I remember when I wanted to start in a grocery store at 16, that was not what I got paid anywhere close to that. Right. Um, and so to think that a, a position like that, that does not require a college degree, does not require special medical training, um, doesn't require a certification of any sort is right now competing with entry level athletic training jobs is kind of nuts to think about. Right. Yeah. Um, and so my point here is that if athletic trainers and I'm talking athletic training as the profession as a whole, which is really hard to, I'm going to say wrangle, um, if they were to, uh, I guess, wrangle themselves in a way and say, we are not being paid enough, or we do not have the proper benefits associated for the level of skill that we provide, the services that we provide, they should be able to go to their employer completely bypassing the whole insurance claims sure. going to Medicare, Medicaid, all that, right? And say, we as an employee group need to go up a level, right? Now is the time to do that because the employers have no options. There's an extreme shortage of medical staff um, and they're under, I'm going to say, challenges like they haven't seen since the polio epidemics in you know, the 1950s. We've got doctors and nurses and PAs and PTs, everyone trying to fill gaps. They're being overworked. Um, you know, they've been basically on this crunch time for 20 months straight now, and we're seeing labor shortages and they're not getting better. So there's a lot of gaps in the healthcare field right now. So athletic trainers as a profession, I'm hoping should be looking at where these gaps are. You know, where can they fill in that would ease the burden of others in the healthcare facility? Or where can they fill in as the experts on a subject? So as an athletic trainer, 
you know, I'm sure that you've been trained on all sorts of things, concussions being one of them, or how to do post-op rehab. Why not have you as an athletic trainer or other athletic trainers fill those gaps? So that way nurses that were kind of floated into those areas can be reassigned to areas that they are more in scope for. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting economics that go on here, right? So you're, you're kind of weighing where the supply and the demand is. And this is, this is where the, the fun stuff for, you know, anybody that's in a business area looks at this and, you know, forget the, forget the topic. Let's look at the overall, um, the balance on this, right? Because what's happening right now is this market needs to find a new equilibrium. And that's not going to happen until either supply, supply and demand match each other. And it's out of whack right now. You've got athletic trainers that are saying, hey, we, we should be paid more, right? Um, and I agree with that completely. And I think there's a lot of people that would agree with that. Now, it's just a matter of figuring out who's going to end up paying for that. Right. Right. So you've got demand from lack of services from COVID. But I think there's also a competitive nature that employers should be looking at from servicing for, for having athletic trainers provide services. So you've got employers, and I'm going to say employers as in like schools that are providing athletic trainers, have providers, um, sorry, athletic trainers as positions for, you know, at a university athletics, right? Mm-hmm. Or down to a high school level or middle school. I'm not even sure how far that goes to be entirely honest, right? But they should all be competing against each other at this point in time. Um, because there's a shortage of athletic trainers. Mm-hmm. So how do you kind of capitalize on that as a profession to then increase your abilities to get you know higher pay there? Um, and I think there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, and it really comes down to how can you, I guess, wrangle all of the data that's out there and rank order it and make it public. So what I mean by that is, let's say there's a hundred jobs that are out there for athletic trainers right now that are posted at universities across the nation. Are all of those jobs equivalent to each other? Probably not. You know, there's different, there's different levels. Let's say there's entry, middle, and senior. So you can, you can kind of, you know, categorize them that way, but there's other aspects to that position as well. So you've got salary, which is the obvious one. You've got benefits. Um, I think, you know, one of the major um, discussion points that's been going on in the athletic training world is should this, should ATs operate under a medical model or Mm -hmm. is it through the athletic, is it athletic department model? Yeah. The medical versus athletic model. Right. And I think there's a lot of push to go to the medical model because it eliminates that, that conflict of interest you have um, associated with your, with your patient population. So you've got all these different aspects that you could categorize and you could capture. And if you could do that, you could essentially rank which job is the best, right? And you could then publish that information. So that way you've got this athletic training pool of people that are interested in new positions that could then say, oh, well, you know, University of Wisconsin, I'm going to put this out there, um, (laughs) has the best position available. They pay the best. They've got the best benefits. They're in a medical um, uh, setting. Um, I want to go to that job and then, you know, some other university, I'm not going to throw Minnesota under the bus, but anyway, um, another university that's ranked really, really low on that list. They're not going to get an athletic trainer to apply for that job, right? Because they don't compete. It's, it's just a kind of a, it's not a good job to apply for right now that information's out there. I think that we live in a day of technology where that can be captured easily can be categorized easily and published, and it should be. And if the athletic training profession wants to see their overall profession jump, I guess, a salary grade, they should be looking into this. Uh, That definitely got the wheels turning. Um, And I'm guessing a few listeners, when they hear this, will sit there and go, huh, because it's hard to find all of the jobs because not all of them get posted within one central hub, but 
Yeah. Right. Again, but what they you're could saying. Be. So it's 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 called you know web scraping. Yep. You essentially set parameters and you send a bot out to go find all of the information that you put in for that and it pulls it back. There's there are services out there that do this and far more complicated uh, you know, reason codes than than what you're seeing here. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting because you can, to a degree, at least, you know, within our association one, then whoever posts in there, you know, get a general idea, but salary isn't always required to be posted, which is usually a giant red flag for most people, depending on what the job says, but most of them seemingly are those entry level ones. Um, because if you're going to go and try and hire a head athletic trainer, somebody's going to want to know what they can potentially be making and what that salary range is. So those are typically posted. Yep. Um, it seems like, and obviously that varies from place to place, but hmm, yeah, no, and, I think that it makes a lot of sense because then that really does change the game and help set up the entire profession to understand it and see it maybe makes things a little bit more competitive, but that's ultimately the goal. Yep. Exactly. To try and bring the other side to get more competitive because they want to fill those spots. And there's other ways to make things competitive as well um, in your favor. So university is one setting where you can certainly have, you know, athletic trainers working. There are alternate alternative sites where athletic trainers, I think, you know, have begun working in industry mm -hmm. fields. And I think that's a vastly underutilized service personally um, that has all sorts of potential there from for athletic trainers, but also for employers. So an employer, let's say, let's say I work for Harley Davidson. Okay. And I've got, I have no idea how many employees they have. Let's say they have 20,000 employees all working in a factory. And this might actually happen at Harley Davidson. I don't know. I'm not sure either. I don't know, but I'd imagine it's manual labor to a certain extent. And I would imagine, you know, you're lifting heavy things, you're putting, you know, things together, awesome, you know, motorcycles. Um, and I bet you there's all sorts of injuries or chronic conditions that happen with people doing repetitive work like that. And if I'm an employer and I'm seeing large sums of my overall healthcare spend going to orthopedics. Um, because of ongoing, you know, back, knee, shoulder, you name it, problems that are being treated at higher levels of care, um, it would make perfect sense for me as an employer to say, okay, I'm kind of just shifting all this funding outside. Why not instead hire an athletic trainer and have them operate internally as an employee of mine and have them run a model, which then directs that kind of external care internal here. And to help to essentially take care of what can be taken care of within the scope of their, their uh, practice. And of course, you know, ship out what can't be, I would bet. And there's probably studies on this that I had, I not familiar with um, that you see dramatically lower healthcare spend, um, which goes directly to a bottom line of an organization. So if you can create additional, uh, services or sorry, not additional services, but additional places of service where athletic trainers can compete in or can work for, you suddenly have once again, shrunk the supply field um, even more so by increasing the, the, the demand of, mm -hmm. um, of athletic trainers. So as that gets more and more and more spread out, the, com the competitiveness in order to get that athletic trainer increases, which therefore drives up their, their overall base pay. And you don't have to deal with claims. Right. Yep. Uh, yeah. I think that's been a huge shift. And I know there's a lot of people in those settings that have, you know, within the profession have advocated get ridding, getting rid of the emerging in quotes word of that, because they are here. Yeah. I know people Absolutely. that work for Delta, they work for, you know, Amazon's become a player in that where now all of a sudden you're coming in with a good salary comparable to everything that's across the profession currently, yep. but you're also talking about working 40 hours a week and actually making that number, the legitimate number, not yep. having it written on a piece of paper and really meaning 60 yep. plus. Or that whatever. is a, that's a nine to five. And there's, there's 
a benefit that comes along with that, being able to go home at a predictable time and see your family Yep. Um, or not working, you know, on a Friday night late covering a football game and then a Saturday morning early for an all day soccer tournament. Yep. You know, there's that, that work-life balance that has a number that's difficult to put on there, but you feel it when you know it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking from personal experience, I know that one. I, my salary may have decreased subtly, but my hourly rate shot through the roof in theory on paper because of the change of it. And the benefits are also a little bit better. So we'll just take that as well. Yeah. And, and it also, I mean, having that something like that in play, whether it's a factory job or if it's in office setting, because, you know, people in office settings have back problems too, or, you know, whatnot, Mm -hmm. Um, really regardless to the employer, it's a way for that employer to differentiate themselves as an employer when they're trying to grab key personnel, you know, if they need a new chief of whatever, and you can say, Hey, I've got all these benefits and, you know, our competitors have those benefits as well, but, we have an athletic trainer on site providing medical services as you need. You can use as many times as you'd like. That might be what wins that person over. Sure. So it's just another way to differentiate themselves as an employer. I think that's all really good insight for, you know, the selling of yourself as an athletic trainer, that you are an asset and you bring a unique skill set um, to the game that can really be, a game changer and Absolutely. not be an overly large investment for some of these much larger companies. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else we didn't cover? My, my, I've got so many ideas running through my head right now. That <laughs> just so, based on what you said, but I want to yeah, make sure we're get, get touching base on everything. Yeah. One other thing I would say, you know, we've talked about, you know, working with employers, we've talked about trying to increase the demand um, on all of this. I think one other aspect, and this ties into where we're talking about Medicaid and Medicare, is the legislative requirements that need to happen in order for this to happen. Going straight for the federal government is hard. Um, sure. <laughs> that, that's a difficult road to go down. But I would encourage um, athletic trainers uh, to take more of a grassroots approach to this and start working with local governments. Um, There's, there's an incredible power at school board meetings. Um, You know, you go to a school board meeting and you start talking about the important aspects that an athletic trainer can bring to that school, to their functions for the safety of the children. Um, If there's any sort of funding that can be associated with that, or you can, you know, pair 15 schools together um, to try and increase that, uh, that demand. Um, I think you could do a lot legislatively at a lower level of government and then build your way up to state and then federal. Um, And probably a lot of that's been done, but I don't think it's, I, I, I say this uneducated yet. I assume that this has not been done universally at all levels of local government. And I think there's a lot of power there that often gets overlooked. Yeah. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, I know that has been a push and people within the profession know this as well. There's some 30 plus percent high schools in the country that don't have any access to an athletic trainer. And then that number goes up significantly again, when you talk about Mm full-time access to an athletic trainer. So it may be a smaller school where somebody's popping by for a couple hours, a couple times a week. Um, And I know, uh, and we'll have just for everybody listening, uh, someone from the Corey Stringer Institute on um, probably a couple of weeks after this one comes out talking about some of the initiatives that they've put forward um, to try and help spur some of this and show the benefit and help guide some ways. So um, lots of good information coming on that. um, Excellent. These next couple of weeks. So uh, looking forward to getting that out as well. Excellent. You know, there's, there's a lot of power that parents have in this, um, in this world. And especially when it comes to how schools operate. Sure. Um, And I think if, a school, if parents of a school that don't have an athletic trainer realize that every time their kid fo- steps out on the football field or basketball court, 
that they're at risk and there's no one here that can really help them. That's scary. Um, and that's, that's an emotion that has a lot of power, fear. And it's something that could be tapped into, not unnecessarily. Um, I think there's ways to manipulate fear in, in ways that are egregious, but there's also ways to utilize that to then say, well, we can solve this. And this is a relatively easy problem to solve. I guess it's going to cost money, but at the same time, what's the value of your children's health? Sure. Makes me wonder how we survived growing up. I didn't know what an athletic trainer was in high school. I still remember a coach taping my ankle when we just assumed it was a sprained ankle when it <laughs> happened. So, uh, yeah, nor did I. Yeah. But I, I played volleyball. So, <laughs> either way, yeah, just how we made it through. Yeah. So I remembered very clearly I jammed a finger and the coach was pressing around. He goes, Well, I'm pretty sure if it was broken, you'd have already wanted to punch me by now and you haven't yet. And to me, that made all the sense in the world. But man, uh, what an evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's, I think, a good evolution. It's public yes, health I in action. Totally it's slow, agree. but it's, it's all in the right direction. Well, if there's nothing else specific to cover, we did want to ask you a few of the athletic training chat questions. We've amended them just a little bit, um, sure. being not directly in the profession. But from your vantage point, from the first one, is where do you see the athletic training kind of profession going in the next five to ten years? I feel like we've kind of covered some of these things a little bit, but if you could kind of sum it up. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, what I would say is I think you're, I think the athletic trainers as a profession in the next 10 years for sure. I question five, just because things move slow at the federal level, sure. I could easily see um, athletic trainers being covered as a service through Medicare and Medicaid, which would then have a massive domino effect across insurers. I think that there can be a lot of headway made at individual insurers in that time period, which would make that transition much easier at a national level. And I would encourage insurers to keep an open mind to that provided that you know, things are done appropriately within the scope of, of care for athletic trainers. Um, you know, that, that's a key element to it, but I think that will happen. Very curious about this one. And I think, again, we kind of covered some of it, but I'd like you to sum it up again, if you wouldn't, if you'd be able to, is what advice would you give a young athletic trainer who's about to venture out um, just finishing up with them now? mostly master's degree, um, entry level, what, what advice would you have to them? Uh, I would say don't settle. Um, you know, the first offer that you're given is not going to be the last offer you're given. Uh, and I would try and make a list of all the things that are most important to you. If it's salary, great. If it's work-life balance, great. Um, and once you have that list uh, made out, use that to negotiate because while yes, you might have a single offer right now, you could very easily have five more come in the next day and it's your market to choose from and feel free to play each other's offer, offer off each other. Um, any good negotiation will, will be in your favor. And if you don't know how to negotiate, there are services out there that can help you understand the basics for it. It will dramatically increase your, your experience in the output of those negotiations. I have no, pl you know, financial plug in this, but I'm just throwing it out there. So I've, my, I've got a master class subscription uh, for a gift, which is just an online hosting of a bunch of very talented people. And there was one who was an FBI negotiator in his master class was how to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Obviously a little bit different, a little, uh, different. <laughs> a little different, but a lot of the concepts yep. um, and he actually had in there how to negotiate for salary. And it is, there are really simple things you can employ if you can go in there and take your time and breathe. And um, I'll try and remember to link up a few books that I've really liked as well that can kind of help with that. If people are there, I need to get better at it personally as well. So yep. um, I, I had an excellent teacher, uh, Moshe Cohen. Um, I think he has his own business too, but he was a professor of mine at, at Boston university and it was, it was a semester long course. And all we did was learn everything that you could learn about with negotiations. And it has had a dramatic impact on my life. Um, so if, even if you're looking to just take a course out of the blue, take a negotiations class. Absolutely. 
I remember saying to undergrads, because I remember this for me, coming out of grad school, you're at the worst plight is everybody's looking for a job, but not every job is looking for a person. Yeah. And I think that has shifted because it was always the best way, easiest time to find a job is when you have one, which probably still holds true to some degree. But I think it is a lot easier for those other ones now because there are so many out there and you're going to have that leverage, if you will. You just got to believe that. Yep. Um, I'm going to switch this one up just a little bit, but, uh, and you may have just answered this one as well. Now that we got talking about negotiation is what would be the most influential resource that you would have for an AT kind of looking to we'll get off the third party reimbursement, but get a better situation for themselves. Sure. So, I mean, the negotiation aspect, I think, is certainly part of it, but we can get on to the third party reimbursement aspect Perfect. of this, actually, um, because I think it's important to understand who you're negotiating with, who you're trying to work with, um, because, you know, athletic training through and through you're you're trained in that mm -hmm. you are probably not trained through and through on insurance. Um, and just likewise, insurance companies are, do not have a, a lot of familiarity with athletic trainers. And so if you're not speaking the same language, if you don't even know what language to talk about, you're not going to have a conversation on this. So do your homework and learn everything you can about insurance, but more importantly, find a friend that knows a lot about insurance that is open to this conversation and willing to do a little bit of grunt work. And I guarantee you, you're going to make leaps and bounds in whatever pathway you're trying to go down compared to doing it yourself and not understanding sure. how to talk to each other. Makes complete sense. I'm going to skip question four because we've already okay. covered how to advocate for third party reimbursement and better pay. We kind of hit that one. Um, this last one, um, if you could change or eliminate one thing around, you know, insurance um, reimbursement for athletic trainers, you know, it could be a misconception um, or just kind of the process for athletic training to continue to build that. And as you mentioned, it's going to take a little time. What would that be? Um, I, you know, I think there's a misconception, uh, that athletic trainers have been plagued with, unfortunately, just by the profession, um, as a lack of understanding as to what people who are athletic trainers actually do. Um, and it's, this isn't an insurance problem. This isn't a medical professional prof problem. This is an overall systemic problem that people just don't get it. You know, they only see athletic trainers on, you know, the, the football games on Sunday or, you know, basketball games running out and, and helping people that are injured. There's so much more to the profession that I think is unfortunately washed away. And that information needs to come to the forefront. Um, people need to understand the impact that athletic trainers have, not on athletes, but as they're as they're actively being athletes, but the long-term consequences of actions of athletic trainers in a positive way. Um, you know, in, there's different ways to do this, but you know, where are the PSAs right now of athletes whose lives have been saved by athletic trainers' actions? Because I know personally a number of stories where that has happened, but we don't see it. And I think that's a really important thing to, to have come out. Um, you know, where's the story about an athletic trainer that happened to be in the right place at the right time and knew what to do um, when a hockey skate goes to the neck and cuts a jugular or when someone has a C-spine fracture or has that third concussion? Um, these types of stories are the elements that will change the, the momentum of this culture and get un other individuals to understand the depth of this profession. And once you can get past that hurdle, I think so much more of this um, washes away. It, it becomes so much easier. The road is paved at that point. Follow up question to that. Um, obviously you tied into the profession just a little bit more than just somebody coming off the street, you know, and knowing a bunch of them being married to one. From your vantage point, you just kind of referenced the PSAs and everything like that, but how else do you see 
and obviously you're getting a master's in public health too, which also can has a unique insight in this. How do you see that? Because I've had this conversation before with another athletic trainer. You know, if somebody says a you know a nurse, people generally know what a nurse does, and you know that can be from interaction with them. But you say something with the athletic trainer, and we still struggle with oh, you work somebody out. You know, you have some of those things. Are there any other things that you see that could be done a individually, but b just also with the profession to continue to do that outside of kind of the public service announcements that you referenced? Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm going to go back to my, my undergrad, like marketing, uh, courses here. Sure. And you know, there's, there's demand for a product because the product is good. And there's demand for a product because the, de- the, the product is popular. I think it's, I think athletic trainers absolutely have a service that is unbelievably good. Um, the popularity of it, I think needs, needs some polish. Um, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to describe, but at the same time, if you can make athletic training, a hot topic item for sports figures to talk about, for teams to boast about that, they have one of the best athletic training groups and that therefore their athletes are going to be healthier and outperform their competition. If you can do this at an employer and say that we've got this, this great athletic trainer or group of athletic trainers working for us. And our employees have, you know, less injuries, have better overall well-being, that are healthier in general and has lower costs in healthcare. These are the types of items that people need to tie into the ongoing narrative of what athletic trainers do. And when you merge those two together, you've got a product or a service or a profession here that I think becomes relatively unstoppable. I think that's kind of a perfect place to kind of wrap it up. I, I love that idea. Um, again, wheels are spinning, which I'm sure again, people listening to this, if they haven't already are starting to also have that um, as well. So I appreciate the insight. Absolutely. To that. Happy to be here. Um, just to kind of wrap things up. Uh, if people wanted to reach out to you or connect with you, uh, what would be the best way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn. Um, just search Brian Stam. Um, you'll see a, a picture of me. So there's that. And then also um, I'm getting more and more into Twitter. Uh, I was a little slow on the adoption on this one, but uh, you can catch me at epi under dash nomics. So epi nomics. All right. I'll look forward to giving that a follow as well. Uh, see what insight is out there and provided. Can't thank you enough for taking the time. Um, I knew I was going to learn a lot coming into this and I definitely did. So I appreciate that. Um, and also taking the, the patience in terms of us to get this set up. I also appreciate that as well. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. And, and don't worry about the patients. I have been a little busy, so no worries. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, thank you again and look forward to hopefully more conversations in the future. Absolutely. Sounds great.